Welcome to the 2020 Golden Goose Award Ceremony. Things might look a little different this year because normally we gather in the Library of Congress and this year we gather in my library, but we're thrilled you can join us again for the ninth annual award ceremony. I'm Frank Sesno and I am delighted to be back as your Master of Ceremonies. The Golden Goose Award celebrates silly sounding or serendipitous science that has returned serious benefits to society. And this year we highlight three teams of researchers whose federally funded research is helping us to understand and respond to COVID-19. In a year in which science funded by our government is more urgent than ever, seemingly obscure federally funded research has led to major breakthroughs. And today we're honored to recognize researchers for their tireless efforts toward the development of life-saving medicines and treatments that have the potential to help us tackle the unprecedented global challenges we currently face. As you know, the story of COVID-19 is still being written, and the science is happening in real time. So this year's awardees represent three outstanding examples of the urgent work that's being undertaken as we speak around the globe. And though we don't yet know what the full impact of this research will be, this year's Golden Goose COVID-19 recognition demonstrates how scientific and technological advances that result from foundational scientific research supported by the federal government can quickly emerge to meet national and global challenges. Nominations for the Golden Goose Award can come from anyone. So if you have a story to tell, either for the Standard Award or the COVID-19 recognition, please share it at goldengooseaward.org. Nominations are evaluated by a distinguished panel of scientists and science professionals who comprise the Golden Goose Award Selection Committee. The Golden Goose Award is supported by the many organizations and institutions on your screen who make this ceremony possible. The American Association for the Advancement of Science, known as AAAS, manages the Golden Goose Award with the support of the Golden Goose Award Steering Committee. The Golden Goose Award benefactor organization is Elsevier, and this year's contributor organizations are the Association of American Medical Colleges, the Association of American Universities, Battelle, IEEE USA, United for Medical Research, Vanderbilt University, and Vanderbilt University Medical Center. We also appreciate the generous contributions of our supporter organizations. I'd now like to welcome remarks from the American Association for the Advancement of Science which houses and manages the Golden Goose Award and is one of its founding organizations. Hello, I'm Sudit Parikh, and I have the privilege of serving as the Chief Executive Officer of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. I'd like to thank you for joining us for the ninth annual Golden Goose Award ceremony. AAAS is proud to be one of the founding organizations of the Golden Goose Awards. These awards highlight the exciting and often serendipitous nature of discovery. We know that unexpected research results can often lead to positive impacts on our everyday lives. Like the rest of the world, the Golden Goose Awards have pivoted in 2020 in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This year, we're shining a spotlight on the many scientists and engineers working to address this devastating pandemic. We're very excited to tell the stories of just a few of these researchers. Their collective work is ongoing, as is their curiosity, determination, and ingenuity, all in the service of advancing science and serving humanity. Congratulations to all of our honorees, and we hope you enjoy the show. And thanks again to the AAAS for all that you do and make possible and inspire. I want to turn now to remarks from Elsevier, a global information analytics business that's been a benefactor sponsor of the award for the past six years. Hello, I am Anne Gabriel, Senior Vice President for Global Strategic Networks at Elsevier. On behalf of the Award Committee in Elsevier, I thank you for joining us for the 2020 Golden Goose Awards. This has been a year of unprecedented communication, research sharing, and productivity in the service of a common goal. It has been immensely encouraging to see that federal funding for research has remained strong, which is both a credit to the members of Congress who have worked tirelessly to make this happen, and a testament to just how important science is for shaping policy and public understanding in times of crisis. This year, more than ever, has brought into sharp focus the intersection between what can sometimes seem like abstract 
abstract or obscure scientific progress and its very real and tangible effects on our daily lives. Please join me in congratulating and celebrating the winners of the 2020 Golden Goose Award for their critical contributions to scientific progress during this turbulent year and in wishing them the best of luck in their future research endeavors. Congratulations. Thank you, Elsevier. And again, thank you to all of our sponsors who make this award happen year after year. The Golden Goose Award has always enjoyed strong bipartisan support in Congress. Our current gaggle of supporters are Representative Suzanne Bonamici, Representative Rodney Davis, Representative Bill Foster, Representative Elise Stefanik, Senator Chris Coons, Senator Cory Gardner, and of course, the man we affectionately call Father Goose, Representative Jim Cooper, who came up with the idea for this award. So we're pleased now to show you messages from some of our congressional supporters. Hi, my name is Jim Cooper. I'm the congressman from Nashville, Tennessee. And sometimes I'm called Father Goose for helping co-found these awards. We're here tonight to celebrate government-funded research. We're here to ask for more funding for such research because really nothing in public policy is more important than knowing what you're doing. And finally, we celebrate the discoveries that result from that research. And sometimes these discoveries are accidental or serendipitous. I hope that all Americans will learn to appreciate science, to learn from science, and ideally to love science, because it's really the path forward for all civilizations. I hope that in this time of turmoil and trouble and worry and concern, that we can appreciate science more than ever and hopefully boost the budgets of government funded programs so that more scientists can do more great work to help lead our nation, our world, and our universe forward. Thank you, Golden Goose recipients, and thank you, attendees. This is a wonderful endeavor. Nothing is more important for public policy than knowing what you're talking about. Hello, and thank you all so much for supporting the Golden Goose Awards an important effort to honor the unexpected results of the federally funded research of our remarkable scientists. For those of you who might not know me, I am Congressman Bill Foster, and I'm proud to represent the 11th District of Illinois. But I sometimes introduce myself by saying that I represent 100% of the strategic reserve of PhD physicists in the U.S. Congress. Sometimes science progresses through enormous, focused, and well-funded efforts to prove an existing theory and sometimes that theory is proven and sometimes disproven, but either way you learn something and science advances. At other times, science progresses with totally unexpected discoveries. Uh, for example, before coming to Congress, for 23 years I was a high energy particle physicist at Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory in Batavia, Illinois, designing and building giant particle accelerators and detectors that were used to discover the long predicted top quark the heaviest known form of matter, which was discovered exactly as predicted, although at a mysterious high mass that remains a mystery today. But before that, my PhD thesis experiment involved building a giant tank of ultra pure water, the size of a six story building in a mine underneath Cleveland, Ohio, and surrounding that tank with thousands of super sensitive light detectors to search for the rare event of a proton decay that had been confidently predicted by theorists around the world. Well, we did not find proton decay, which surprised all of the theoretical physicists, but what we found instead in our giant underground detector was the burst of neutrino particles from a giant stellar explosion, a supernova. Because it turns out that 160,000 years ago, in the Greater Magellanic Cloud, a star blew up, one supernova. And for 160,000 years, the pulse of light from that gigantic explosion, as well as the pulse of ghostly neutrino particles, traveled toward the Earth from that explosion. And when they arrived in 1987, the astronomers saw that pulse of light with their federally funded telescopes. And quite by accident, we saw the pulse of neutrinos in our underground detector, which was also federally funded. So the scientists learned a tremendous amount about supernova explosions, from that incredible stellar blast that occurred, if I may say so, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. 
So my background in science is one of the many reasons that I'm excited to come and help represent Congress at the Golden Goose Awards every year. I know firsthand the value of research and development and how it holds such benefits for our country and the world. In a year in which science funding is more urgent than ever, federally funded research continues to lead to major breakthroughs. We recognize these groups of researchers today for their efforts towards the development of life-saving medicines and treatments that have the potential to help us tackle the unprecedented global challenges that we currently face. The nature of scientific research is that its impact is hard to predict. Although the story of COVID-19 is still being written, this year's Golden Goose Award recognized COVID-19 researchers and how scientific advances and technological innovations that result from foundational scientific research supported by the federal government can quickly emerge to meet national and global challenges. It is research that springs from curiosity and thinking in new ways that leads to new groundbreaking solutions to serious problems. And we need sustained federal funding to make those solutions possible. I am hopeful that, for a variety of reasons, we may be approaching a Sputnik-like moment with an opportunity to not only preserve, but to expand science funding in the United States. The Golden Goose Award is a perfect opportunity to remind everyone why federally funded research is so important. The awardees here today exemplify why it is so important to fund curiosity-driven research. Their research and, and findings expected or not, have helped make our world a better place. So thank you to everyone who made this possible. Greetings, I'm Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici. Congratulations to the awardees. It is an honor to join you virtually for another Golden Goose Award celebration to recognize bipartisan support for research and the value of scientific discoveries and creativity in addressing complex problems. Thank you to Representative Jim Cooper, our father goose, for his work over the years to lift up scientific discoveries that could easily be dismissed. The coronavirus pandemic is a stark illustration about why we need to listen to the best available science. It takes courage to research areas when the benefits are not known at the outset. The fear of failure can be overwhelming, but it must not inhibit the imagination and the work of the scientific community. Seemingly obscure, federally funded research has led to major breakthroughs, and the Golden Goose Awards are an important opportunity to tell the stories behind those scientific discoveries. By telling the story of your research journey, you are helping to inspire and engage the next generation of scientific leaders. As a senior member of the Committee on Science, Space and Technology, I have always been a champion for federal research. I acknowledge that the federal government needs to be an active participant in funding basic research, even when, especially when, the benefits are not known. The committee and I have also been conducting oversight on efforts to censor science and undermine scientific integrity. We simply cannot stand on the sidelines and allow this to happen. We have a responsibility to engage the scientific community in decision making and to use science to inform policy. We cannot solve the next moonshot challenge without the expertise of scientists. Also as a leader on the Committee on Education and Labor, I know that maintaining innovative leadership requires a cutting edge workforce. That's why I founded and co-chair the STEAM Caucus to integrate arts and design into STEM because educating both halves of the brain leads to more well-rounded students and a more inclusive workforce. STEAM education also equips students to more effectively communicate their scientific discoveries. Science is unpredictable. To help demonstrate the value of federal investment, I encourage you to continue to tell your stories about how you persisted, even when the results were unknown when you started. Congratulations again to the award winners. Thank you for illustrating the tremendous value of federal research, even research with odd sounding titles. And now it's time to reveal our awardees. I'm going to announce their names and then we'll tell their stories in another annual Golden Goose tradition our documentary video. Dr. Kismikia Corbett, Dr. Barney Graham, Dr. Emmy DeWitt, and Dr. Vincent Munster.
They work at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, part of the National Institutes of Health. Dr. James Crow at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Dr. Jason McClellan and Daniel Rapp at the University of Texas at Austin. All of them are doing incredible work on potential vaccines and treatments for COVID-19. So, without further delay, we present to you our 2020 Golden Goose COVID-19 Recognitions documentary video. At the end of December, we heard about this outbreak uh, in, in Wuhan, China. I thought nothing of it. Maybe like 40 people had pneumonia. Of course, we didn't know what we know now, that there is a big pandemic. It was January 6th. I was snowboarding. My wife and I flew to Italy in February 10th. We were visiting in the Siena Cathedral. I have blurry vision <laughs> around the first two months of this. My assumption was that if it wasn't influenza, it was probably a coronavirus, which we study in our lab. We saw this virus spreading quite rapidly. It really like, made all the alarm bells go off. Going through a vaccine development program uh, requires a thousand decisions and a thousand things to go right. When something like this happens, you immediately start to contact each other. When I got a call from Dr. Barney Graham. Get ready to get back in the saddle. Hey, did you see this? And I immediately texted Daniel. Three in the afternoon, so I'm sure I was in lab. I got up, I went to my computer. We got so busy so fast. The pandemic just marched toward us. I started to email our um, collaborators. We had to launch our full response team during that time. And complete pivot to working on SARS-CoV-2. We didn't have reagents, we didn't have blood samples from survivors, we didn't have anything, but we knew we needed to launch, so we did. Our team pulled together and started the process. When we first heard this, we thought, that's silly, that, that can't ever be done. This type of work takes years. I think in the last decade, we perfected a process in which we can make antibodies in about six to 24 months. But the more we thought about it, we thought, well, we, we probably can go quicker than we go now. And so with our team, we started a stopwatch, we did a simulated epidemic when we went as fast as we could and we got the whole discovery process done in about 78 days. Of course, we had 20 years of fundamental research about the human immune response that we were using as a basis. So we knew we could speed up the process. The first known case in the United States walked into an urgent care in Seattle, Washington on January 19th and we had to pivot and we did the real exercise to do discovery of antibodies for COVID. The blood sample became available on a Saturday evening. We were able to contact the, the CEO of FedEx who contacted his team and were able to move the sample with a GPS tracker overnight into Memphis. One of the company folks drove in a Lincoln Town Car to my home in Nashville, Tennessee and handed me on a Sunday morning the sample and I rushed off to work. So the sample was actually about two days old by the time we got it, and we were so excited to get it into the lab and start working, but when we looked at the cells under the microscope, they were not alive. And then we started brainstorming a little bit, and we realized that the genes for the antibodies that we were seeking were still in the tube. So we sequenced the RNA and DNA that was in the blood tube and made a library to decode the recipe for all of the antibodies there. We needed to move so quickly in this instance that we could not rely on our usual techniques. So we turned to a next generation sequencing, supercomputing and bioinformatics and artificial intelligence, and single cell biology in which we were testing individual cells from human bodies one at a time, but doing that in thousands. And we had to do 
This work under very uncertain circumstances. Many of the scientists were working uh, as many as 20 hours a day. Once we identify sequences that are interesting to us, that's just letters on a computer. We need to physically make the DNA and we use instruments that can synthesize the DNA. It's like a desktop printer. We put in a code and DNA comes out that we can use to then make antibodies. So we obtained blood samples in March and about 24 days later, we were able to pass on the recipe for the cure, the DNA sequences of antibodies that we discovered to a pharmaceutical partner who could do the manufacturing. Of course, we want to do these things quickly, but also safely. So they were testing the materials they had manufactured for several months, working with the FDA to ensure they were safe. And by August, they were using the antibodies that we had started making in March. So that, that period was very, very compressed and rapid, but still we went through all the required steps to be safe. And uh, now we're into what are called the phase three trials, which are the efficacy trials to see how well these molecules will work to prevent and treat the infection. Often people wonder, haven't we exhausted the number of studies that we can do on something like the immune system? I think the more we learn, we, we sort of are just chipping away at the edges and we see there's so much we don't understand. Medicine, therapeutics, prevention, vaccines, they all grow out of the curiosity of how the world works, which is discovered through basic science. We really had a nice breakthrough around 2012 uh, when I was able to determine the crystal structure of the RSV fusion protein. Xavier Salens, who's our colleague at Ghent University, reached out to him uh, because he was interested in using that protein to immunize llamas. Uh, it sounds weird to say it with a llama. And because he was able to design specific mutations into that protein, he was able to stabilize it and make it a much better vaccine immunogen. I was snowboarding with my family in Park City, Utah, when I got a call from Dr. Barney Graham, and he let me know that he was talking with the CDC, and it looked like the virus that was causing pneumonia outbreaks in Wuhan was a, a beta coronavirus. I remember getting a WhatsApp message from Jason saying that there's a novel beta coronavirus in China and that we're going to try and put a rush out and determine the structure and hopefully work towards developing a vaccine. But to be honest, at the time, I, I thought nothing of it because maybe like 40 people had pneumonia in Wuhan, so I didn't think it would become a global pandemic. that's when the rush sort of started. We were getting tons of emails from Barney and Kizzy saying, can we introduce these mutations into the new spike? Can we get the genes ordered? Can we start to express protein and see what it looks like? These molecules are like transformers. They start off in one conformation. When it encounters our host cells, it then undergoes this really dramatic change where it kind of explodes up the top shoots part of itself into our own cell membranes and then refolds and bends back around into this other conformation called the, the post-fusion shape. Llamas, in addition to producing more conventional antibodies like you or I would produce, they also produce these smaller antibodies which are called nanobodies. A full nanobody is about half the molecular mass of a conventional antibody. The reason why that's interesting to us is because it tends to make the nanobodies more stable, and it also tends to allow them to bind into small nooks and crannies that larger antibodies wouldn't be able to access. Basically, an antibody treatment or a nanobody treatment could be administered to somebody who is already sick to try to reduce symptoms and fight off infection more quickly. So our plan was to send Xavier prefusion stabilized spikes from SARS and MERS and then they would immunize Winter the Llama to try and isolate these single nanobody that was capable of binding many different spikes from many different coronaviruses. And then the idea was to have this one nanobody that we could potentially have on hand, we could stockpile, 
and it would work against all known coronaviruses as well as coronaviruses that had not yet emerged into the human population like SARS-CoV-2. Technically, we did fail at our initial goal of trying to isolate the single nanobody that can broadly neutralize many different coronaviruses, but we're still able to identify the one nanobody that seems to have good reactivity against SARS-like coronaviruses. These are experiments that we've been performing for years now, but because we've been doing them for so long, we've gotten really good at them to the point where a sequence was released online and within weeks we had an atomic resolution structure of that protein, which was then going into vaccine trials. So I think it's an excellent example of why we have to fund basic science broadly and begin researching different pathogens because we don't know which ones are going to ultimately break out and lead to a pandemic. When a pandemic breaks out, that's not the time to start years of research on that pathogen. You need to do it ahead of time. Our goal was go fast, organize, and be able to go into phase one clinical trial in 100 days and obviously we uh, exceeded that expectation and goal with 66 days. Most of what really prepared me and us really is the work that even started before I got to the Vaccine Research Center around SARS and MERS and how we might make the best vaccine for a uh, uh, before a virus that might be akin to those two viruses. We'd studied how to make the vaccine design. We'd studied the type of platform that we might want to deliver that vaccine design. And so when it became clear that, that was, it was time, um, everyone just essentially dropped everything else that we were doing um, in our small team. We've gone through this drill a few other times trying to get our vaccines into the field in time to get an answer uh, before the outbreak waned. MERS, Ebola, Zika, SARS, Nipah virus. Uh, during that period of 2014 to 16 or so, uh, we were working on the structure of spike protein, again with uh, Dr. McClellan. Finally solving the structure of the endemic coronavirus, HKE1, allowed us to see the structure well enough to start designing stabilizing mutations, and that was done and published in 2017. And those stabilizing mutations are the basis for our work during this coronavirus outbreak. So my interest in emerging infectious viruses is particularly what are the steps which facilitate this transmission from, for instance, like ducks or dromedary camels or bats into the human population. We're now a married couple for quite some time already, but we're very complementary to each other. We did this work together, but Vincent's main thing was the vaccine. Um, and my lab's main thing was antivirals, actually. With MERS coronavirus, we um, started working on some animal models, which are really important. We were actually the first um, people to establish an animal model. And by doing like field research in the Middle East, uh, in Qatar and Jordan, that gave us a lot of expertise in working with coronaviruses, vaccine development, which really made us like in the right position to start working when SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 came along. We were able to provide the world with the first basic information on, on this virus within 11 days and a breakthrough speed, I would say. Yeah. After the experience with Zika, we uh, developed a plan for us to do what we call a prototype pathogen approach to uh, pandemic preparedness. And that, all that work helped put us in a position to, to have a better design for this vaccine that we're developing now. Early in January, we already decided if this really turns out to be a coronavirus and we can get the virus, these are the things we do. So there was already a plan. So the next three days 
after the sequence came out was really around organization. So we were ordering mice, we were ordering DNA plasmids, we were starting to think about how we would optimize different assays, the pace at which we are going. It was very intense. We did, we did come in at certain nights as well. So that allowed us to quickly move and we had uh, clinical grade quality uh, material back from Moderna within 41 days or 42 days after the sequences were released in a crisis like this and try to save days as much as we can because those days add up. All of these laboratories coming together to make one solid thing. It's happening now because every single scientist, especially in the world, wants to make sure that we get through this. And I think it's very clear that science is the only way that we will. I've always enjoyed solving problems. I think part of that came from our work on the farm. We had to solve problems every day just to get through the day. Science became a passion of mine in elementary school even. When I was a kid, I loved just collecting things, especially seashells. I love the patterns and the forms. I think that's the first time I understood my passion for biodiversity, which became really my career. It's hard to have freedom if you don't acquire your own funding. Fortunately, we had funding from the National Institutes of Health showing that we can greatly facilitate a response to a pandemic by having already done much of the research in prior years. I think the diversity of funding is important. Those dollars are often paid back much more than what was paid in. Congratulations to all of our winners and the work that you're doing. The nature of scientific research is that its impact is often hard to predict. A year ago, I don't think any of us could have foreseen being in the middle of this global pandemic we're experiencing today. And yet the collective expertise of our country's research enterprise has helped to quickly pivot to address challenges related to COVID-19. We are so grateful to our 2020 Golden Goose honorees and to all the scientists working every day to advance our understanding and treatment of COVID-19. So we asked our awardees to tell us a little bit more about their work. Our first question though is a little personal. Are you getting enough sleep? <laughs> <laughs> you start. <laughs> well, 2020 has been a pretty difficult year actually. It's gone in waves. Earlier this year it was rough. I wasn't getting too much sleep. Lately I've been catching up. We actually tend to take quite good care of ourselves. Long year, but so far so good. The Golden Goose Award highlights the unexpected impacts of federally funded, curiosity-driven research, as we've said. So we asked our awardees to talk about the role that federal funding plays in their research. One of the beauties being part of the NIH is that we have this allocated funding that we get every year, and so we're not dependent on grant funding. So. That allows us to do the research that we are really interested in and that we think is really important. And I think that also allows us to change what we think is important as soon as these things happen. And so that's what has allowed us in the past, in the case of MERS coronavirus, to immediately drop everything we were doing and start to just focus on MERS coronavirus. And that's also what allowed us now um, to start focusing on SARS-CoV-2 as soon as it happened. From a graduate student's perspective, it's given me the freedom to uh, think about these problems in sort of a more creative way. Uh, I don't have to worry about every single dollar that I'm spending on my experiments. I can sort of pursue things more broadly, even if I think they might not uh, cure the next pandemic. Uh, but also having access to federally funded resources that are shared amongst laboratories, like the synchrotrons that I've talked about. Um, those are huge institutions that would not be able to be maintained by just a single university. So having federal funding to keep them running is really important. Science is expensive. Trying to keep the lab well-funded uh, can be stressful as, as funds are decreasing, trying to figure out how to prioritize experiments and students. Uh, fortunately, we've been uh, relatively uh, good at accruing funds so far from a variety of sources, including the, the NIH, and uh, allows for an environment where students can explore 
experiments they're interested in. Some of this year's awardees have had long and distinguished careers, while some are early career professionals or even graduate students. We asked the group, how has COVID impacted your lives and work, and what's next for your career and research, given the extraordinary year that you've all lived? Well, I'm a graduate student, so I spend a lot of time in lab anyways. Uh, COVID-19, uh, it's, it's had an effect, uh, obviously, on, on family, uh, not being able to, to travel, dealing with schools. I have a nine-year-old and a six-year-old now. Uh, well, running a lab has been more difficult. Uh, we have to try and keep the density down. So the students and, and postdocs are now working in two shifts. So it's been, been difficult. Well, we were very excited to be successful in our SARS-CoV-2 campaigns. Uh, and we've been doing these antibody discovery projects one by one. So we did Ebola, or we did H5 bird flu, and now we've done COVID. Uh, and I'm rethinking how we do the whole process. Instead of doing these things one by one, I want to do 100 targets, and I want to do them ahead of time. I don't want to wait until thousands of people are dying. I want uh, to do a large-scale discovery where we take the 100 most and almost certainly one or more of those most likely organisms is going to cause an epidemic pandemic and we're going to be ready for it if we do this large scale project. Uh, and I used to think, well, we'll never do that. It's too big, it's too much money. But now I think it's too important not to do this and I want to use my talents and time and those of my team to develop a platform where we're ready for almost anything. So next we asked the group to fill in the blank. Here we go. As a scientist, I'm inspired by... As a scientist, I think now more than ever, I am inspired by the Dr. Grams, I guess, of the world. I love the, um, the inspiration I get from people who work on our team, especially trainees. I would say I'm inspired by frontline workers. People who are continuing to not just lead in their field, but also bring up the generations behind them. Um, for me, that's really inspirational. I think they've been doing a really tremendous job. Um, the scientists have been working extremely hard uh, with long hours, but the, a lot of the frontline workers in the hospital dealing with COVID patients, long hours, wearing PPE, I find that really inspiring. Um, their, their lives are really on the line. Um, many, many people have died uh, from working with the COVID patients. And so I find that inspiring. I, I hope our research and some of what we've been able to do uh, can help mitigate that. We have people from all sorts of nations, faith backgrounds, um, and personal experiences. And I find that incredibly inspiring to hear people's stories and why they get into science. They say, I came from a place and I wanted to make a difference, and I ended up here for the opportunity to work with talented people to make the world a better and just place. And to me, that type of commitment is inherently inspiring. Strong mentorship often features into Golden Goose Award stories, and that's certainly true this year. So we asked our awardees to speak to what makes a good mentor and why mentorship is so important in science. One of the roles of mentors that can be especially helpful is to see the scientists and trainees say, I see you, I see your story, I know you're wondering if you're good enough, and the answer is you wouldn't be here if you weren't good enough. In a, in a major medical center in our time and world to be working on these problems, you're definitely good enough to be here, and uh, you're smart enough and creative enough, you deserve to be here, and I'm glad you're here. It's a competitive environment out there, and you need to have uh, people cheerleading for you, people who are promoting you, uh, allowing you to do interviews, to, to present at conferences, uh, to nominate you for awards. For me, I think that what matters probably the most um, is that a mentor is, is willing to pull out a chair at the table for you. A real mentor sees that there's something that's beneficial for the people who have been sitting at the table for years. I think everybody needs mentoring in different ways. And sometimes you just have to get out of the way. And sometimes you need to open a door and push them through it. I think a good mentor is just as focused on the personal development of their student uh, as they are on getting results. 
Our final question for these seven inspiring researchers was, what would you say to a young person interested in following in your footsteps, who looks around and sees both the opportunities and the very significant challenges that scientists face today? Don't be afraid of what you don't know. Like, did I 10 years ago think I would be like doing stuff with dromedary camels or being like involved in like vaccines? No, I did not. Like, but somehow, like if you have faith in yourself and have the right mentors and the right circumstances, that's all perfectly doable. Science is one of those things where the gratification is far delayed. <laughs> as soon as possible, I think that someone who wants to be a scientist, as daunting as it seems, has to train themselves to understand that, that sometimes the success is in the failure. Knowing your own strengths and applying them with experience, your passions grow out of that and be patient with that because it'll be there and um, diverse experiences are good. You don't have to have a linear beeline to a single goal that's 20 years out from where you are right now. Go for it. I think if this is what you think you want to do with your life, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks again to all of our awardees for their thoughtful comments, and their incredible work. It has been an honor to highlight the great work of all of these honorees tonight. So let's recognize them one more time. Please join me in a round of applause. <laughs> these stories highlight why it's so important to support federal investment in scientific research, even if we don't always know where it'll take us. Our awardees represent just a few of the many stories of scientists and engineers tackling the very serious challenges posed by COVID-19. Congratulations to all our awardees. Thank you to members of Congress, to our sponsors, to AAAS and the founding organizations, and of course, to you, our audience, for being with us here today. Our most heartfelt thanks go to the scientists, the researchers, the engineers, the health workers, and all the essential workers toiling away through this pandemic, often at great risk to themselves personally. You are our heroes, our lifesavers. Thanks again for joining us. Congratulations again. Until next time, I'm Frank Sesno. <laughs>